morning. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and good afternoon. I'm Liz Ecker with Senior Housing News, and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Next Big Challenge, Serving the Middle-Income Senior Housing Market. Today we're going to hear from several experts on this topic, uh, given their experience in working directly with senior living communities and operators. First, I would like to welcome and introduce our speakers. They are Dana Walshlager, who is principal with Plant Moran Living Forward, Jamie Tamadio, vice president with Plant Moran Living Forward, and Rick Bannis, who is vice president of development and positioning for Garden Management Solutions. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes before we kick it off here. Um, we plan for about an hour of discussion today, um, after which we will be um, conducting an audience question and answer session. So if you do have questions, you can submit them in writing via the GoToWebinar platform that you should see on your screen. We welcome your participation in that portion. Please submit questions as you have them, and we'll get to as many as we can during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, a recording of the presentation and the slides will be made available, so please look out for an email in the next few days coming with that information um, with instructions for accessing the materials. A big thank you to everyone for joining us today, um, and thank you to our speakers. Without further ado, we'd like to get started with an audience poll. We'd like to find out from you what your definition of this market is. So you should see a poll question um, on your screen. It is a multiple choice question. We'd like to know how you define the older adult middle income market in terms of annual household income. So please select one of the following options. Um, households earning less than 25,000 annually, households earning between 25 and 35,000, between 35 and 50,000, 50 to 75,000, or more than 75,000. And we'd like to kind of just gauge your um, concept of this market before we get into the conversation it will help set the stage. So please select the option on your screen. And then we'll just give it one more moment to collect your responses. And it looks like we have a little bit of a bell curve here. Uh, um, with the majority defining this market as household income um, annually of thirty-five to fifty thousand um, dollars. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dana with Plant Moran Living Forward. And Dana, um, I think that sets sets the stage for a lot of the information that you will be providing today um, and some of the discussion here before us. Terrific! Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to participate on this webinar today. We're really excited to talk about uh, a subject that we're really, really passionate about. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, or at the end of this webinar, um, we hope that um, you will walk away with information that has clearly defined the challenge. Um, we're certainly going to review some of the facts and, and details with you, and then also offer some alternatives and, and options and solutions. And so I'll just start out before we get into many of the specifics. Um, I'd like to just start out by saying that, you know, as an industry, we've spent a lot of time talking about the statistics specific to the aging population here in the United States and across the world. Um, and, you know, in 2014, 2016, there were, uh, or there are 48.6 million older adults in the United States that are 65 years of age and older. And by, by 2060, um, that number will increase to almost 98 million. And we've been talking about this for the better part of 10 years. Um, this shift in demographics that that is coming down the pipe or in some cases is already here but and we've evaluated these numbers um, and calculated the impact of of this shift on demographics and, and, and the impact it's going to have on our marketing efforts and our recruiting efforts and healthcare reform but what we have not spent a lot of time focusing on is how we're going to meet the needs of nearly 30% of older adults that earn between 25,000 and 50,000 that fall into what we call the middle income market. And so for those of you that selected C, the middle income market being defined um, as individuals who earn between 25 and 50,000, you, you are correct. 
Um, and let's just take a moment to talk about who that person is. Who is that middle income market person? Well, I will tell you that that person looks a lot like my mom. Um, you know, she's going to be turning 70 this year. Um, she likes to hang out on to 69 until September, but turning 70 this year, she's, she's widowed um, and is only collecting one uh, income now and talks about all the time about how her finances would look a lot different if my dad was still around. It'd be a two-person household income. Um, she's got a modest nest egg and equity in her modest home. She's in good health, but worries about how long her income is going to last and um, how much money she's going to need to to have her her healthcare um, needs met. And, um, you know, my mom is perfectly fits into that category of an individual who has too much income to qualify for traditional low income housing, tax credit housing, but not enough to put down a half a million dollars on an entrance fee and $5,000 a month to, to live in a, a reasonably priced uh, assisted living community. So, you know, as a country, we know uh, this industry has done a pretty good job, actually a, an excellent job, of meeting the health care needs and housing needs of older adults that are in that high net worth or upper, upper middle class individuals that are able to afford those entrance fees to CCRCs or, or the higher end market rate senior living. And with few rare exceptions, um, my counterpart speaking with me today, um, we've done a mediocre job of meeting the housing needs of our extremely low and very low income older adults, but even as it relates to low income senior housing, we've failed to combine the housing and the service components that those older adults need to age in community. So today we want to focus specifically on how we meet the housing and health care challenges for this middle income older adult population. We want to talk very specifically about the demographics, the living expenditures and spending habits of this population, income levels and retirement savings or lack thereof, as, as some of the information we'll share will show, and then some of the potential solutions and garden uh, garden management successful experience of developing and operating uh, housing and services for that middle income market. Um, interestingly enough, yesterday I was at a uh, another conference here in Chicago, senior housing conference, and a colleague of mine, Jim Collegian from Senior uh, from Pathway Senior Living, caught me yesterday, and we uh, started talking about this topic. He knew that we were going to be speaking today, and we started hashing over the challenges that we face, including the fact that we need to change policy in order to meet some of our middle income market demand. We need to improve reimbursements, not the least of which is actually getting paid in the state of Illinois. We need to improve government communication between agencies, um, like between HUD and the Department of Health and Human Services or local housing and finance agencies. We definitely need to improve the regulatory environment. We need to reevaluate our building code requirements. And we need to create um, better financing incentives to investors so that they get involved. And so what I told Jim yesterday was that, um, you know, this webinar is certainly a far cry from having all the answers and there is no silver bullet. But absent having this conversation today and pushing this critical agenda, the likelihood of us ever coming up with good solutions is, is not going to ha happen. And I know that the collective wisdom of this, uh, this industry and the leadership and their passion to affect change is what's going to drive solutions. So I just want to start with um, talking about the actual costs. And, you know, we can, we can pull multiple different um, sources for uh, what the costs actually are. This one came from um, a guide to senior housing, which is uh, came in uh, was published in uh, 2016. But you can see here that um, depending on the type of senior living situation or housing and services that you need, um, the cost of this senior living care can range anywhere um, on an annual basis from 17,000 per year to $91,000 per year. Um, and, and those are just the national median annual costs. And I, I will tell you, um, my grandmother was a first generation woman that worked in the late 30s, early 40s. And if I asked her, and I did often, you know, Graham, did you think it was going to cost, you know, $41,000 a, a year to have care and services? And she looked at me like I was cross-eyed. And, and, and that's the problem today. These folks work very, very hard, but never, ever anticipated that it would actually cost this much um, to, to live in a community 
um, and receive these services. So one of the things we wanted to drill down um, when we were talking through this topic was we, we looked a little bit at the, the ex annual expenses it is for a senior to live in an independent and an assisted living community. And what we did is we pulled the average rents for all across the United States. We used NIPS data, so we pulled across the top 99 markets in the U.S. Um, and then we also looked at the Midwest market and what the average rent is for independent living services and also assisted living services. So you can see our numbers here for the average independent living community. It's $2,971 in the U.S. and $2,614 in the Midwest. AL is $4,365 across the country and $4,275 in the Midwest. And what we did then is um, when we're doing a lot of our market studies um, here at Plant Moran, what we typically look at is how much of that, how much so our seniors obviously are going to spend uh, a certain amount of money on their housing, and then they're going to have to have a certain amount of money left over to pay for the rest of their living, whether it's food or clothing or whatever it might be. And a factor we typically use is for an independent living resident, they typically spend 60% of their income on housing. And an assisted living resident typically spends 85% of their income on housing. And this, and this chart here shows on the left-hand side our independent living column. Um, across all of the United States, the average annual expenditure, so for, for their housing plus all of additional expenses a senior will have, they're spending about $59,000 annually. In the Midwest, for an independent living senior, they're spending about $52,000 annually. And you can see an assisted living, they're spending $61,000 across the United States and $60,000 in, in the Midwest. So we have some relatively high numbers, and if we think about that poll that we, we gave where most folks are thinking, you know, our, the majority of you, I think it was 52%, said that middle income is the thirty-five to 50000 income range none of those folks would technically be able to income qualify for these. So they need to they need to draw upon some of their retirement assets or, or assets they have um, handy. And we're going to talk through that as well because clearly our seniors need to have some income, but they also are going to need some retirement assets to afford to live in our in our senior living community. And and to your point, Jamie, I think looking at that that um uh graph really should be forcing all of us in this industry to start thinking about how we evaluate our market study, studies a little bit differently. Is, is the right number, that 35000 and above threshold, should it be pushed a little bit based on the fact that we know that cost of care continues to increase? Um, what, what this slide is showing is really kind of um, defining the, the continuum specific to affordability. And, and I, think, um, I think when people hear the word affordable, their brains immediately go to low-income housing. But um, there is this broad continuum of affordability in senior living, and we kind of wanted to um, lay that out for you. So on the, on the far left-hand side, you've got truly, truly affordable housing, which is really geared towards the extremely low and low-income uh, older adults, and that would typically be your your HUD uh, HUD uh, financed and project-based subsidies in public housing and project-based subsidies in say the 202 uh, facilities that were built for years and years. Um, you also have a situation where from the um, local housing authorities, uh, a, an older adult might be able to secure a, a housing choice voucher, which allows them to live anywhere. Uh, that uh, a landlord will accept that, that creates some level of affordability. In both of those two instances, those are you know, what we call a, a project-based subsidy and a resident, unlike what Jamie was just describing, would typically only pay 30% of their adjusted income for, for rent, and then the federal government will offset the balance of that and pay that to the landlord. Moving across the spectrum there into the moderate uh, income range, um, you, you fall into what, what is referred to as the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, and that's been around for a number of years now, and, and uh, we've been providing senior living in that environment um, for the better part of you know, 15 years. Um, but there are some different income requirements, and there are income uh, qualifications. In this particular instance, uh, when you income qualify for low-income housing tax credit community, we're simply looking at your annual income. 
you can see in the, the um, box up above, we took the Columbus, Ohio area median income for 2016. And again, if we focus on that middle income market that we all defined as between uh, 25 and 50,000, you can see that roughly in Columbus, Ohio, 60% of the area median income is about 29,280. 100% would be 48,000. And so we know that there are a number of people that, that fall somewhere on that spectrum. And I would argue, and we'll show some, some demographics and information in a minute, that 30% of the population, uh, senior household population, is, is being missed uh, in terms of our ability to provide decent, safe, adequate housing that meets their, their financial means. Um, of course, another method of, of affordability would be to move into a market rate community um, and then uh, tack on a, a Medicaid waiver to help pay for some of the services that they need to, to be able to age in community. So again, just keeping in mind that spectrum of, of uh, affordability, you can see on that grid also so that 30% or extremely low income is 14,000. We've got housing for them, but what about the 60 to 100% area median income? That's who we're focusing on. So we wanted to just visit a little bit about some of the older adult characteristics, and some of these are likely not much of a surprise to you, but 88% of senior households strongly agree that they would like to stay in their current residence, whatever that is, whether it's the family farm or an apartment building, for as long as they possibly can. And 89% of senior households agree that they would prefer to remain in their own community um, for as long as possible. Uh, which, which is not surprising. Um, we know that the typical resident is an 87-year-old woman that has needs for assistance with ADLs, two to three needs of, of assistance for ADLs, and they can have up to two to three of the top 10 chronic conditions. We know that these older adults are coming to our communities um, more frail, uh, primarily because of the fact that they want to stay in their current residence and stay in their current community. So we shouldn't be surprised by this, although it has been a significant shift over the last 10 years, um, the, the age continues to creep up. 54% um, of the residents are 85 years and older, and 27% of the older adults that we're serving are between 75 and 84. The one um, piece of information or statistic that really jumped out to, to me, and we talked about this as a group quite a bit, is the fact that independent living residents spend up to 70% of their time in their apartment, which in my opinion begs the question as to why we're spending so much money on water features and uh, beautiful marble tile in the lobbies um, we need to think about where our residents are spending their time. That's not to suggest that we shouldn't be focusing on programming, but I would argue spending our time on programming versus a water feature or a living wall in the lobby is going to bring a much greater value, which is what we're talking about today, to the clients that we're serving. And I took a look at this, and my first reaction was, does the 70% of their time include sleep time or not? <laughs> Secondly, uh, what are the activity directors and the rest of the staff doing to get residents out of the apartment? And then I thought about my mother and her two sisters who are in their uh, late 80s, early 90s, and they live alone. And I don't think they come close to spending 30% of their time outside of their home doing things they're spending probably 85, 90% of their time mm -hmm. in their home. And all of the similar types of individuals, the older adults who tend to be isolated in their home, isolated from socialization, uh, none of them drive. So it's a situation in which um, you take a look at the 70% of their time. I think there's some really uh, good marketing opportunities to be able to say, we can offer opportunities for residents and older adults to spend more time outside of their apartment as opposed to in isolation. Mm -hmm. I, I would also point out to, to your point, Rick, that um, some of this, these statistics and some of this information came from the Bipartisan Policy Center. There's a white paper that they just released in May of this year called Healthy Aging Begins at Home. And for those of you, um, 
uh, that are providing services to older adults, this is a must read um, and it will um, really spark, number one, conversation back in your communities or within your organization and number two, really help you think differently about how we continue to provide services to older adults. You know, I have one last comment on this slide and I think it kind of paints the picture on, um, the, you know, the first two comments about how residents want to stay in their current, current community um, really drives home to that point of our, our seniors are coming to us older and more frail because they want to remain in their current current residence. So when they do move in, they're older, they have they have more needs for, for assistance and they're a higher acuity resident, which is why we're seeing the average age being as high as 87 uh, and 54% of the folks over the age of 85. And you think about that and you, and, you, and you realize those folks have obviously been retired potentially for 20 years, may, maybe less, so they've clearly been drawing upon their financial assets that they've, that they've been saving for. And we showed you before, you don't, they're not earning enough to, to sustain income-wise uh, to live in some of our senior living communities. So that puts even a larger strain on that financial asset class of how much have they, retired, how much have they saved in their retirement accounts to afford to live in some of our senior living settings because we know um, these numbers are just going to continue to increase. With modern medicine, people are going to continue to live longer and they're going to want to stay in their residence. They'll stay in their current homes as long as possible and start to come to us. And we're, I wouldn't be surprised if these, these average ages increase significantly. So thinking about that, we, we, we flip to the, you know, where are our seniors spending all of their money? And we start with looking at really three different age cohorts. First one we're looking at is the 65 plus age cohort, which is our teal colored uh, chart on this on this bar graph. Um, and you can see, um, you know, where our 65 plus age cohort is spending their money. The orange cohort is looking at our 65 to 70, 74 um, age seniors, and the and the green bar on this bar chart is looking at our 75 plus uh, age, age seniors. And what's interesting is, you look at these top seven spending categories for our seniors. The only two that increase from the 65 plus to the 75 plus age cohorts are housing and our out-of-pocket health care costs, which is really no surprise probably to many of us in this industry. And it really drives home that seniors are not really adding anything to their, to their income level, most likely. They're, they're probably capped out. And at a certain point, clearly you're going to stop contributing to your retirement savings account and, and start significantly drawing upon it. So as those two spending categories continue to increase for our seniors um, over, the, over the next 20, 30, 40 years, really making sure that we're building a, communities that they can afford to live in. And you'll see in um, a later slide that we talk about really the income gap and, and how significant it is on how much savings our seniors have um, for that, that. We break it up in quintiles, so the, the upper class clearly has a significant gap in the amount of money they have saved in their retirement accounts. Our next slide is looking again just at our income levels and it paints the picture where Dana made the comment that we're missing 30% of the market. And what she meant by that is, you know, if you look at our bar graph in the top right of this slide, you see that in 2021 and really 2016, the purple bar, 29%, is showing the number of seniors over the age of 85 who earn between $25,000 and $50,000. And that's clearly an individual who really kind of falls in that middle income market that we were defining here in the first couple of slides. And it's painting the picture that that is a massive market that if they do not have financial assets, and I think, you know, you, we might start to clearly see that that's most likely going to be the case looking forward. Um, this is a massive market that, that we're missing um, for our seniors, seniors across the country. Uh, we're showing you we're showing you in the top left here kind of just the, the, the se severe growth in the 85 plus population across the country. Uh, currently we're at about 6 million seniors who are over the age of 85. In 2040 that number is going to be close to triple with 14.6 million seniors. So clearly a massive growth in, in, in the 85 plus community. And our, our last chart here, I won't go through it, but this is again just painting the picture of where Dana was talking about kind of defining, again, that middle income market that's between, between thirty to 50,000 um, income ranges. So this slide here is looking at the average per capita retirement savings for seniors. And um, we're looking at the senior 
is at the beginning of their retirement year, so between the ages of 62 and 69. And we break it up in three different groups. So you have the average senior, you know, in the, in the, in the bottom 25th percentile has about $24,000 in retirement accounts and financial assets. So we're thinking, we're talking defined benefit plans, 401ks, um, financial assets could be defined as more of a liquid asset is what we're talking about here. Uh, the median income is about $105,000. We're going to give you an example a little later on in this presentation of how that using that $105,000 average median retirement account saving and drawing upon that, how quickly that gets, gets spent when you're living in a senior living community. And then our 75th percentile, to my point earlier, how significantly that gap is, the average for the 75th percentile group is $338,000 roughly. And some of, the, some of the numbers that are a little scary when we look at it is we, when we, we scale back slightly and look at the 55 plus group, seniors 55 and older, 29% of them don't have any retirement assets or any defined benefit plan. So they're just basically living on a savings or checking account and they have some, some liquid assets. The other number that's really kind of jumped out to us when we were pulling some demographics here was over the next 20 years, Nearly 40% of the individuals over the age of 62 are projected to have financial assets of 25,000 or less. And then even further, 20% of them, 62 and over, will have 5,000 or less. So clearly looking at these numbers, you can see a significant portion of our elder population moving forward is, is, could potentially have an issue of not having enough retirement assets to pay for some of the senior living product out there. Looking a step further, more long term, we see, um, as I mentioned, kind of the different quintiles for our different age groups. So again, we're looking at the 62 plus population for, for folks and how much they have in retirement savings. This also adds in home equity this time, and we also look at financial assets. And you can see the numbers that truly jump out to us here are the significant growth in our top quintile, how this grows from roughly 250,000 or so for the median home equity and mean retirement of about 200,000 to 500,000 of mean retirement assets and 490, 480,000 roughly of the mean home equity for our top quintile. But then you look at the bottom to the fourth quintile here and the scary lack of growth really over the next what do we got, 30 years here of, of just flat. flat. Really, it's not moving at all. So it, it brings the question again, we know our housing is going to increase and we know our out-of-pocket costs for seniors are going to increase as they continue to age. Where are they going to pull these this money for? We have to figure out a way to serve them as we move forward. And, and real quick, lastly here on the demographics, and Dana's going to give us a quick wrap up, and then Rick's going to give us some great case studies on what, what they got going on in, in their in their books. Is you know we took a step back and we said, okay, that's what we just kind of talked about was our current seniors and the folks potentially moving in over the next five or ten years. But looking even further at the the wave of individuals in our baby boomer population, and not even that whole population, but really kind of that you know the mid 50s to the 60s or, or folks of that beginning portion of folks coming to retirement and the trend that we've seen in their their confidence for their retirement years that they will have. And over the last five years, we've had relatively strong home growth and we've seen a, a steady growth in the stock market. But when baby boomers were pooled, 59% of them said that they're going to start relying on Social Security as their major source of retirement income, which is a significant increase from five years ago where only 42% of them reported that. Then we, then we see that 46% say that they're going to, leaving money to their heirs is, a, is an important aspect for them, which is significantly down from five years ago where, where 63% were reporting that. And the, probably the most staggering number is 24% feel confident they'll have enough for retirement, which is down from 37% five years ago. So trends in our baby boomer group age cohort is really not looking as very strong either for how they feel they'll have, be living in their retirement years. BlackRock has manages a significant amount of wealth for many baby boomers across the country and what they found is most folks in their retirement portfolio believe that they're going to spend about $45,000 a year essentially 
each year that they, they're living in retirement. However, if they looked at the average portfolio value they had for most of their clients, they were at $136,000. So if you spread that over an individual's typical retirement year, that only comes out to $9,100 a year in annual expenditures that they can afford, or essentially a $37,000 a year shortfall to be able to afford their, their retirement years um, when they're lo no longer working. So that might feel a little bleak. In fact, <laughs> uh, when we were going through and pre preparing this presentation, we you know put a lot of these statistics together, and we all kind of just shook our heads and felt um, you know a little overwhelmed by it. Um, but you know, again, I think I think the pieces to focus on is the fact that. Um, we've established what that middle income market is and, and you know we would encourage everybody as you're looking at different development opportunities or looking at ways to reposition existing uh, assets that you may own or, or manage, um, we, we need to continue to focus on that middle income older adult. And that doesn't mean you have to do 100% tax credit building. Maybe, maybe you just create a portion of your building that, that targets that middle income older adult. Um, and, you know, across the United States, 29% of older adults we know over the age of 85 um, have 25 to 50%. So again, we're not focusing on that group. We're focusing on the very, very low income or extremely low income and the folks that really can afford um, that luxury senior living environment. Um, the average median retirement savings is about $105,000. That's hardly enough to, to, to live on as, as these older adults continue to age. The gap in the retirement savings between the top earners and the rest of the population, we know is expected to increase significantly over the next 40 years. And we also know that the younger baby boomers, their confidence is continuing to diminish uh, over the last five years as it relates to their ability to afford the communities that we're either currently operating or those of us that might be developing. So we need to rethink this, this uh, age demographic in this market. We at Garden feel that there's a world of possibilities, opportunities that are created uh, and can be created by serving the middle income market. A number of years ago, we opened a community out in the western suburbs of Chicago, and it's a community that can serve older adults of all income. So we can serve individuals who have uh, unlimited wealth. We ha can serve individuals who uh, our middle income individuals who may be currently on Medicaid or uh, are on a Medicaid spend down. And when we first opened the community, we had a significant number of individuals move in from a market rate community that was up the street from us. And after they were there for several months, we were curious. We wanted to know what they found different between what we were offering at our affordable assisted living community versus what they experienced at the private pay market rate community that they had moved in from. And they told us there were three things. One was that we didn't have fresh flowers on the dining room tables on a consistent basis, that for most meals we use placemats as opposed to linen tablecloths, and that we were about $900 a month cheaper, and that their comment was, for us, linen tablecloths and fresh flowers at dinner were not worth $900 a month. I have had the opportunity over the years to work for uh, a variety of different types of products in the industry. <clears throat> I've worked with Classic Residence by Hyatt, where we've developed, and I was part of the project development team for uh, the community that was opened out at the Glen here in the Chicago area, very exclusive North Shore retirement community. And there is a real market for those types of communities. I've had the opportunity to be part of the project de development team for a middle income community that was opened out in the southwest suburbs, Franciscan Village, community that was designed specifically to serve the middle income market. Uh, many of our communities at Garden are designed so that we can serve a variety of older adults. 
uh, on average about 67% of our residents uh, are on Medicaid, but that means that 33% of the residents, a significant percentage, are moving into the communities and they are private pay residents. If you take a look at our portfolio, there is a variety of uh, different types of communities. We have a community in the inner city of Chicago that we assumed in 2008 the management responsibility of the community. Um, the community was developed and funded using a combination of a variety of different funding sources from low-income housing tax credits, bonds, home funds, block grants. This particular community is 100% um, Medicaid so that uh, all of the apartments have to meet tax credit requirements and typically 98 to 100% of the uh, residents are on a Medicaid waiver. We have a, at the other end of the spectrum, a community out in the western suburbs of Chicago. It started off as a 132 units of affordable assisted living operating through the supportive living program here in Illinois, conventionally financed to start. Uh, we expanded the community uh, to initially include uh, 32 memory care, affordable memory care apartments. We added an additional uh, 18 assisted living apartments. And then we went further and expanded the community uh, a second time. Uh, there wasn't room on the campus, so we built a uh, memory care community that is 30 apartments that's about a half mile away. and the community is now was refinanced through HUD. Uh, the community is 30% private pay, 70% Medicaid on the assisted living side, and it's about an even split with our memory care apartments between private pay and Medicaid. We have a community in a metro area, mid-sized metro area, that was funded uh, using low-income housing tax credits and bonds. 80% of the apartments have to meet tax credit requirements, uh, maximum income requirements, 20% are market rate, and we're seeing a 50% uh, private pay percentage quite a bit of the time at that community. And we have a community in, the rural, in a rural area, it's our smallest community, only 41 assisted living apartments, in a town that uh, has 3,000 residents, in a county that has less than 8,500 residents, but it was developed by a hospital foundation. It's part of a hospital campus that also serves or also has a nursing home on the campus. Again, a variety of financing sources, low-income housing tax credits, home funds, bonds used to uh, finance that community. When you take a look at the uh, our average um, rent that we get, and we're defining rent as including room and board and all of the services, the personal assistance, the help with medications. The only uh, revenue that would not be included in those figures are other revenue that we would be getting from uh, beauty barber salon, from guest meals, uh, from uh, various types of uh, small $15, $20 a month charges that we may have for things such as uh, Wi-Fi access or uh, uh, cable television services. When you take a look at the averages and the range, we're really looking at from just over $2,800 a month down in southern Illinois to uh, a range of almost $3,500 a month in Cook County when you're taking a look at the average, we're able to, and this combines private pay as well as uh, what reimbursement we're getting from uh, the resident who would be on Medicaid and from the state reimbursement and federal re reimbursement from Medicaid. It ranges from roughly $2,800 a month to uh, uh, just under $3,300 a month. And these communities, if they uh, are operating efficiently, and have uh, high enough occupancy levels, they can generate 33 to uh, uh, 40 uh, percent plus uh, return on investment. When you take a look at, from a tax credit standpoint, a community like Rockford, the 
uh, residents who have to qualify for a tax credit program can't have an income above $28,440. Uh, when you take a look at uh, the St. Louis Metro East area, uh, that figure is about $30,000. When you take a look, we talked about the um, uh, median retirement savings of 105000 When you take a look at what uh, an average monthly rent of $3,300 a month uh, would provide in terms of the opportunity for someone as a private pay resident to live in the community for a period of time versus the median um, expenditure in the Midwest for assisted living of 4275 and if you're assuming 80 to 85 percent of their living expenses would be paid uh, or would be allocated to the um, fee that they would be paying for assisted living that less than a thousand a month uh, difference in terms of the monthly rent can add two or more years to someone's life expectancy in a senior living community. It can go from 3.1 years to 5.4 years. And still make money for the investors. And still make money for the investors. I was walking out of the state capitol in Illinois uh, a couple of months ago, and uh, I looked up and there was a building that was about two blocks away that was obviously a low-income senior living building. It looked, you could tell it was uh, a senior living building just from the standpoint it, had, it was all brick, multi-story, had no character whatsoever to the building. It had the wrought iron balconies that stuck out from uh, the uh, sides of the building. You can develop buildings that have the look of any, um, nice assisted living community and still be able to do it in a fashion that generates a nice bottom line for the owners, for the investors in the community. These are three examples of communities that we manage, the exteriors of the building. These are examples of the interior of the building, an outside gazebo with uh, raised planter boxes, a community room, a front entrance area, a dining room. They may not have the appearance of a Ritz-Carlton hotel, but it's more of a Fairfield Inn, a residence inn, a nice hotel. Um, the interiors of the apartments, they may be smaller in terms of size than you will see in uh, market rate communities but the opportunity for residents to be able to decorate the apartments to their taste, uh, to be able to personalize the apartments to their taste. Uh, um, when we take a look at the options that we see available tomorrow, there's a whole group of people who are, uh, can be private pay, they're value conscious upper income older adults. These are the uh, individuals who may be able to afford to fly, uh, fly first class on a major airline, they're flying southwest. Yeah, great example. You have the private pay, middle income people, generally uh, thirty dollars to $50,000, depending upon what geographic area you are in and whether you're in a more urban, suburban, rural market. You can have a mix of private pay and Medicaid waiver. You can use the Medicaid waiver to boost occupancy rates, to take occupancy rates from the mid-80s up into the uh, mid to high 90s. You can use them to uh, sell, uh, to rent hard to uh, sell apartments. And you can use it to provide a safety net, that opportunity that if someone runs out of money, they have the opportunity to continue to live in the apartment. The focus is on value, the focus is on meeting needs as opposed to wants. And you take a look, the uh, boomer market in particular may have a lot of desire for more meal choices. They may have the desire to be able to uh, dine in the dining room anytime from uh, 6, 7 o'clock in the morning until 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night. 
the question becomes, especially when you're taking a look at the middle income market, are they going to be able to afford those types of ones? There's a variety of financing sources that uh, can be combined to make a successful community. Conventional financing, HUD, either financing at the time the community is open for occupancy or refinancing someplace down the road. Tax credits. Um, I know we have explored the possibility of REITs and EB-5 financing. We have not found a way of being able to make those successful. Um, REITs in particular because of the impact in years 8, 9, 10 as to what the escalator clauses are in terms of the lease arrangements. Uh, they may be feasible for someone who owns communities and are looking at being able to reposition a community in the marketplace. Um, it doesn't seem to work well for a management company who doesn't have or isn't go going to be able to get value from the equity that uh, the sale of a community to a REIT would have. Uh, various types of housing authorities, uh, low-income housing tax credits, bonds, um, the Department of Agriculture, home funds, uh, Fannie Mae grants, getting creative with grants for energy efficiency and maybe for some other types of uh, programs that we uh, would be able to take advantage of if we had a somewhat different political climate. I, I would say that um, you know developing a, a affordable or middle income market uh, senior housing is, is certainly not for the faint of heart. I mean if you if you're going into this assuming that you can get a deal done and you know um, developed from concept to completion and in about two years, you know, if you are using these other forms of financing, it is going to take a little bit longer. One of the one of the things, though, that I don't think we have to worry about uh, relative to speed to market is that I don't think somebody's going to come in and take the demand because it turns out everybody's ignoring the demand for of that 29% of the people that we've been ignoring. So um, we need to this, these types of senior living communities do require a lot of heavy lifting on the front end as it relates to cobbling these the, the financing together but the the long-term success um, certainly outweighs that if, if if that's something that interests you some of the challenges that we face in terms of uh, the Medicaid waiver programs as we uh, look from state to state capacity uh, does the state have enough capacity to be able to uh, uh, provide for uh, a significant number of additional people who would be on the Medicaid waiver. Uh, reimbursement rates, if you take a look here in Illinois, in southern Illinois, our rates, uh, daily rates are just over $64 a day, and up in the Chicago area, it's a little over $81 a day for a resident on Medicaid. You go down to Florida, and it's $32 to just under $43 a day. The approval process, how long does it take for the community to be able to be approved not only for assisted living but to become a Medicaid waiver provider? Uh, we have seen states where that process can take four to five months from the time the community opens its doors for occupancy. And how long does it take for the resident to be approved not only for Medicaid but also uh, to be approved for a Medicaid waiver? What is the payment cycle? One of the issues we deal with here in Illinois is that it can take the state uh, anywhere from four to six months, maybe longer, so we have to build in enough reserves to be able to uh, handle that potential payment cycle. In Indiana, the payment cycle is you submit an invoice or bill the state uh, this week, and chances are you're going to be paid next week. Rate adjustments, what's the track record in terms of the state either increasing uh, the reimbursement rates for uh, Medicaid residents or uh, any potential cuts? Uh, not only what is the history, but what is uh, the state projecting for the future? Um, some issues with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. Um, on the um, assisted living side, are we able to uh, have kitchenettes versus full kitchens? Um, 
there's question as to there's additional scrutiny that has to take place. You would think that if a uh, from a continuum of care standpoint that if a uh, community were located near medical offices, near a nursing home, near a hospital, near a rehab center, that that could potentially be a great advantage. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid require you to go through additional scrutiny for that. Because they consider it to be institutional. Institutional, just because of you happen to be located next to another building. Um, when you take a look at it from the standpoint of the memory care side, assisted living memory care, there's a lot of questions as to, uh, again, the type of apartment as well as you would think it's advantageous for someone in memory care to have a difficult time uh, leaving the uh, community uh, so that they don't wander off, they don't escape. Medicare, Medicaid doesn't necessarily think it should be that way. From a managed care standpoint, uh, we have seen managed care companies offer flat reimbursement rates uh, to a tiered system to managed care companies that want to negotiate a uh, fee for each resident who moves into the community and they try to play one community off another community and uh, get the uh, rates down as low as they possibly can. But there's also a real opportunity for us to be able to show there are benefits uh, to someone being in assisted living as opposed to either in a nursing home or living alone at home. Some key considerations as we go through. When you're appealing to a more modern income market, you're really looking at the community being comfortable. You don't necessarily need to have the crown molding, the Queen Anne style furniture, the uh, uh, floral, flat floral uh, wallpaper in community areas, the granite countertops in the kitchen, uh, but you want furniture that people are going to walk in and they want to know where you bought the furniture from because they think it's so nice. By the same token, it is a quality that is a nice quality but not so upscale that they feel like it's nice to look at the furniture but they're not going to feel comfortable sitting in the furniture. The number of apartments, we have found that on scale, 80 to 100 assisted living apartments, and if there's an opportunity for about 32 memory care apartments, that, that tends to be uh, an efficient uh, number of apartments in the community. We have had success with studio and one-bedroom apartments. Uh, we have not found that two-bedroom apartments, uh, uh, that they are easy to sell. A lot of people might think uh, differently. A lot of older adult children might feel that uh, uh, it's more appropriate for mom or dad to have a two-bedroom apartment, but we have had uh, communities where the mix of apartments is 40 to 50 percent studios, 50 uh, percent one-bedrooms, and they've been very successful. In terms of community areas, um, multi-use community areas where you have the opportunity for flex space. It may be that you combine a cafe and a computer center, a TV room, a movie room that also has the opportunity to be able to be opened up and uh, you can uh, use it for chair exercises and for religious services. Um, in terms of services and amenities, um, taking a look at the opportunity to partner with other organizations. We have a community in a university town where interns from the college come in and help run activity programs. Uh, opportunities to partner with senior centers, with the park district, with schools, uh, volunteers, gardening clubs, where the gardening club can come in and uh, work with the residents in terms of uh, planter boxes and vegetable gardens. Um, to make sure that your development and operating costs are uh, appropriate. Very often what I find is that, uh, too often, what happens is that uh, the developer starts off with this nice architectural design that uh, is uh, uh, very appealing but not necessarily uh, affordable. Occupancy, two of the key things there are quick fill-ups and the expectation that you are going to have an extremely high occupancy rate. 
we have moved in 40 to 50 residents in the first day or two and a uh, building is open for occupancy. Our expectation is that we are 50% filled by the end of the first month of uh, uh, the community opening for operation. Our expectation that anything below 98% occupancy is not acceptable. 97.6% uh, you're on a watch list. Uh, <laughs> We have a community, uh, 76 apartments that has gone as uh, long as 21 consecutive months without a lost revenue day. It's part of the culture that you have to have. Um, pricing, we believe in a Southwest model, not necessarily uh, a, um, an approach that is appropriate for everybody, but keep it simple. Uh, not a lot of add-on charges. You know, we don't have baggage fees or change of uh, uh, flight fees. Um, operating costs, keeping the operating costs down by things such as taking advantage of group purchasing for supplies, for food, for insurance, um, taking a look at opportunities to be able to reduce property taxes. Our keys are um, when you're doing uh, and getting started, make sure you have an appropriate market analysis done taking a look at the demographic, socioeconomic situation in a particular area, what's the competition, what options are already available, um, to define what opportunities might be available, and then to do a financial analysis to make sure that the community from a development and operating cost standpoint works. So we threw a lot of information at you. <laughs> Um, and, and you know, we, we hope that this was of some value and, and if, if nothing else, you go back and, and uh, think, think about different ways to create a, a middle income market option uh, for older adults, whether it's a, a full building or whether it's a portion of your, of your building, uh, and think about ways to do that. So, Liz, we'd, we'd open it up for questions if there are any. We want to be sensitive to time here. Yes, and there are. Um, let's see how many we can get to, and if we need to go over um, the hour a bit, we will. Um, first question, um, and I think probably anyone might be able to address this, but some of these are geared specifically toward Rick, so I'll just mention if that's the case. Um, sure. But can you can you speak to the risks of de of depending on government reimbursements for a sub significant part of rent? And how do you mitigate those risks? And I know this is part of the discussion, but could you speak a little more in depth about the risks involved? There are risks involved. There are risks from the standpoint of the uh, uh, state changing the uh, requirements for the Medicaid waiver program for the uh, state to be able to cut rates. We have uh, engaged and continue to be engaged uh, very heavily in political advocacy. Uh, finding individuals, uh, state senators, state reps, uh, individuals in the governor's office who can be champions for the program. Um, it requires due diligence. It requires uh, monitoring to make sure that uh, we stay on top of things in terms of any proposed ideas, in terms of any uh, proposed changes, and to be able to have uh, individuals at the state level um, be our advocates for the program. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing in terms of mitigating risk is if you are able to create a large enough pool of people who are involved in the program as residents, um, it presents more of a challenge to the state to be able to make significant changes because the state is requiring individuals uh, at least here in Illinois, for instance, to spend down to a Medicaid level before they are uh, receiving any of the state benefits. From a taxpayer standpoint, it's a great program. From the state standpoint, it's a great program. The program saves state money. We need to be able to show how the program sta uh, saves the state money. Um, but the more people you have in the program, uh, on a Medicaid waiver in the affordable assisted living communities, the more people that, uh, uh, or the bigger challenge they have in making, the state has in terms of making any uh, significant changes.
Any other questions, Liz? Yes, um, here's one more. On that note, um, you spoke a little bit about the challenges, Rick, just in what you said, um, with states that lack support for Medicaid waivers um, or who don't, don't um, who have limited what Medicaid waiver programs. The question was if you see this as a barrier to entry, which I think you mentioned, but maybe said in another way, are you seeing movement in states that may not have offered this traditionally um, on the advocacy front? Yes, and, and there's a real opportunity. Um, six, seven years ago, we would not have gone into, in fact, we were looking at going into the state of Indiana. Given the uh, uh, political environment and the attitude toward the elderly waiver program, we backed off that decision. Today, uh, they are really looking at promoting the Medicaid waiver program for assisted living in the state of Indiana. Part of that is driven because the director of Medicaid in the state sees this as a real opportunity for the state to potentially save some money. There's also an opportunity from the state's standpoint. The federal government is pushing the states, states across the United States to rebalance. Uh, rebalance from the standpoint of having more of a 50-50 split. Individuals on Medicaid in nursing homes and individuals on Medicaid in assisted living or other types of Medicaid waiver programs. This program really provides the opportunity, the assisted living program, the opportunity for the states to help achieve that rebalancing effort. Here's another question, uh, which I don't think we got too much into, but could you talk a little bit about how margins compare for the more affordable projects um, versus those um, market rate communities that you've worked with? We are seeing, and a lot of this depends upon the occupancy level of the community, but we are seeing margins of 32, 33% to 40% or higher. It, you have to really have a 94% occupancy or higher, and those communities that are achieving a 98, 99 100% occupancy, when you get to that level, I would say that uh, uh, 70 to 80% of the revenue that you generate drops to the bottom line because so many of the upfront costs are already taken care of. The community has to be sized right. It has to be developed properly. You have to have the right operating costs. But a lot of it depends upon the uh, uh, if, if you're taking a look at trying to operate a community like this at 84 to 88% occupancy, chances are you're going to have trouble generating an appropriate bottom line that's going to be attractive to owners and investors. Thanks. Um, here's a question that I think anyone on the panel could respond to. Um, it says, the discussion tended to focus on assisted living. Um, could you provide an opinion as to whether age-restricted apartments are filling a need um, on the front, do they meet a need for those who don't need services but don't want to pay the higher rents um, of independent living communities? Here's here's what I would say. Age age restricted. I, I assume you're really focusing on independent living, and so, you know, I I do think that they can fill the need in certain environments where the regulatory um, and the and the licensing environment is is conducive to allowing people to age in community. So you take a look at the Minnesota market, for example, where they don't license buildings but they license services. You know, um, there's a greater chance of residents having access to the services that they need in an independent living environment um, than say in other states where uh, it is far more regulated. Uh, in terms of licensing the the building, so I, I would say in certain states it certainly helps. Um, but I but you know to, to Jamie's point earlier relative to residents coming to us older and frailer, um, I, I just think that the continued need for the in, the independent living facility is is, is going to decrease, and the need for more uh, of a, a skilled and care driven environment is is only going to continue to increase. I think there are uh, opportunities on the independent living side. Um, 
it all depends upon the needs of residents. And what I often see is that when you take a look at uh, people moving into age-restricted communities, when you're taking a look at people moving into independent living, I'm seeing more the age of those people being very similar to assisted living. The difference is what their need levels are. Um, a couple of advantages that uh, you have in a couple of considerations is what is the ability of the resident to get out of their apartment to socialize or their home to socialize? In an assisted living community, you have shorter walking distances and you have uh, the opportunity for residents to be able to come out of their apartment for th usually two or three meals a day as opposed to independent living or age-restricted communities that are more of a recreational type of community do they have those types of opportunities? Um, and I'd also take a look at cost, because when you take a look at cost of living in a age-restricted community, and if you need services, how much home health care are you going to get? Is a home health care agency coming in for three, four hours a day, or two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening sufficient? and how much more affordable or more costly might that be when you consider all other living expenses to what you are going to be able to take advantage of in an assisted living community. Thank you. Um, there's one specific question about financing. Um, have you, or do you see an opportunity to use Section 142D financing to serve the middle income market? Is that something anyone has experience with? don't have experience with that. I don't have okay. experience with it. I know it's a HUD program and I believe it's a it's a acquisition uh program um but I but I'm not quite sure so I'm not sure we can answer that. But we can do a okay. follow up. Sounds good. Um one question I think Rick you mentioned um Lisa uh, could you say anything about what's typical or what's expected in terms of lease up velocity on the new development um, of the site? We start marketing six months before the community opens for occupancy, assuming it's assisted living. Uh, our expectation is that uh, in about a third of our buildings are uh, filled within a uh, uh, six month period of time. About a third of our buildings are filled within about a 12-month period of time, and about a third takes a longer period of time. Um, a lot depends upon the size of the building um, and the size of the market. What we find are the buildings that are communities that are most difficult to fill are the ones that the uh, owner are, is stretching the parameters of the development, where they think that they they can fill because they happen because they're the owners that things are going to be different and even though the market analysis says that uh, only a hundred to 110 apartments are needed in a particular area they decide to build 125 apartments mm -hmm. um, the opposite we've been pleasantly surprised in some cases but uh, overall I would really pay attention to what the uh, uh, market studies show in terms of what's appropriate for a particular area and I also would take a look at if you are using tax credits to finance the community how does that play out in terms of your ability to uh, uh, be able to fill those apartments on a timely basis mm -hmm. um, especially if you're taking a look at something that uh, you have 80 to 100 percent of your apartments that need to qualify for tax credits. I've always uh, been a huge proponent of a uh, smaller full building than a large empty one. <laughs> Especially if the property allows you to expand. Exactly. It, it, yeah, exactly. Um, this is a question about whether you've had experience with other agencies um, that offer support um, like a local, more of a local housing agency, um, have those come into play at all? Not a local housing agency, but we have had experience. For instance, one of our communities uh, has arranged for residents to be able to use the swimming pool at a YMCA. So the community didn't have to go out and develop 
a uh, swimming pool and have the cost of uh, constructing the swimming pool, operating the swimming pool, the insurance costs associated with it. One of the things that I would say about the state housing finance agencies um, at the state level, uh, from state to state to state, it, it, it varies very much in terms of what their priorities are. And so if, if uh, a developer is looking to uh, make an application for the state's allocation or a portion of the allocation of tax credits, um, there are state housing agencies that, that will put a priority on senior living, and there are others that don't really make that a priority. They would rather focus on family housing. And so um, that's an important area where we need to continue to advocate and educate those state housing authorities um, on, on these demographics right here. They need to start focusing on this, this massive shift, this looming shift in the older adult population that really needs um, to become their priority. Um, here's a question about uh, what is the typical return to equity in these projects um, for new development and acquisition? Um, can anyone speak to that? We can get back to you with an answer on that one. And someone says, we need you in California. <laughs> <laughs> can you come? Call us in February. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can keep um, posing questions. This has been, I think, very um, helpful. Um, and also, just to let everyone know, we can respond or um, speakers can respond to any questions that we don't get to. Yeah, we'd be, um, we'd be happy to respond to any of those. Yep. Yeah. Well, let me just pose, um, I guess, one more. And this is kind of a big picture question. Um, with these types of solutions, um, obviously there's not a ton of development um, serving this market currently. Um, just for each of you, I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, how you see this kind of moving forward, given that there are some solutions in place, but also there are some challenges and barriers to entry. Well, from, from my perspective, I, I think we need to continue this national dialogue. I think we need to keep it front and center. I think we need to continue to advocate and we need to make sure that we're bringing the right parties to the table. Um, there's a number of, of groups out there and organizations and individuals that independently are, are you know, uh, championing this cause. Um, but now we need to, to look to our industry leadership um, to, to collectively get together and start, and start advocating and, and generating different solutions. Um, you know, the, the, the numbers and masses together are far stronger than each individually. And so uh, for me personally, I think that's, that's definitely a, a direction we need to continue to move in. I'll comment. So I, I would say the other piece I think that will be big is without any change, assuming everything stays the same, when we, for a developer or an investor out there, making sure that if this is a, market that we're trying to tap and this product line that we want to serve for these seniors, um, when we put together our team, we, we do the due diligence up front and we spend time putting together the architect and the general contractors and any other consultant you might bring in the table who have had experience doing these type of projects and don't just rely on the ease of letting somebody you know from hotel experience or multifamily experience be the person that really drives this bus because the senior living industry is much different than some of the other hospitality industries out there. And if you don't have the correct team there, you're going to get start off. You're going to start off on the wrong foot, which could be you're going to be paying for it several years down the road. And we at Garden held a national summit about a year ago uh, in Rosemont, uh, brought together uh, over 30 of the top leaders in the industry. Uh, to talk about this very issue in terms of uh, the affordability of assisted living, senior living. Uh, it included uh, Robert Kramer from NIC, uh, representatives of Argentum, um, and Cal, so that it provided us with the opportunity to be able to uh, uh, start this topic of discussion. We continue, we have steering committees that are continuing to pursue various issues in this regard. Uh, it's going to take a political conversation. Uh, it's going to uh, uh, take the or take the uh, 
uh, road of being able to uh, convince people at both the national and the state level. Uh, those housing authorities, the Illinois Housing Authority has been very receptive to this program. Uh, we've worked with them on a significant number of projects. You go into uh, other areas and the housing authority is trying to understand this or they have other priorities. Um, it's going to take some research to be able to document that we uh, truly can save the states and federal government money with these types of programs. Um, and I think, too, it's going to take some uh, uh, convincing at a property tax level to be able to show that um, if property taxes are what uh, is making it difficult for us to make the communities affordable, to make the apartments affordable, there are some other considerations that uh, the uh, taxing bodies need to have. One is that we don't place a whole lot of if any impact on the school districts. And secondly, when you take a look at uh, uh, the seniors who would be selling their homes to move into the community, in many cases they've been uh, taking advantage of a senior property tax exemption for uh, uh, 20, 25 years. And uh, if they sell the house and a new owner moves into the house, suddenly the uh, property taxes are at the current level as opposed to slight increases based upon what they were 25, 30 years ago. I think I think tax incentives as well on the on the constructability side is is really going to be important as well because as we continue to develop and build from state to state to state the regulatory environment is is different as well some require that we build to non combustible standards others allow us to build to stick frame and you know the the cost difference can be 20 to 30 percent higher and so are there tax incentives to construction uh, or other um, folks that participate in this to help offset some of those increased costs. So we, we, we have to get creative. We have to think of every uh, opportunity and solution and put it out there. And, and the standard, well, it's never been done before, doesn't get to be the answer anymore. We, we're going to have to try a lot of different things in order to continue to be successful. Thank you. Well, thank you to all of our presenters today, as well as our audience um, who are on the line. And um, each of our speakers has graciously offered um, his or her contact info here on the slide. And just to reiterate, we will be um, distributing the slide presentation. There are quite a few inquiries on that. So look out for that coming in your email um, to all attendees. And we thank you. Thank you for Have the opportunity. Day, Thanks, Liz. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.